Good afternoon and welcome to a same webinar um, on district level licensing for Great Crested Newts, uh, which will be presented by Jen Almond and Gregor Neve from Natural England. Uh, before we begin, and just while we're waiting for everybody to join us, um, I'll just run through some upcoming events that SAIM have on that you might be interested, interested in. So we have our Scottish conference, which is coming up next week on the 24th, uh, which is on climate change, its impacts on Scotland's wildlife and landscapes. And bookings are still open until tomorrow at midday. And we also have our autumn conference on planning for success, maximizing biodiversity through planning and strategic land use management. And that will be taking place in Landidno on the 19th and 20th of November. And both of those events can be booked on through our training and events area on our website. Uh, we also have some upcoming training uh, that you might be interested in. So we have vegetation surveys using phase one and MDC techniques, QGIS for ecologists and conservation practitioners, uh, protected mammals survey and identifying coastal wading birds. And all of those can be viewed on our training and events area and also booked through there. Finally, we have an upcoming webinar on delivering the diversity in biodiversity net gain, uh, which will be presented by James Hewitson Brown, who is from Wildlife Turf, and that's on the 7th of October. And bookings, it, again, it can be booked through our training and events area. Okay, before I hand over to Jen and Gregor, um, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, um, but feel free to send in your questions throughout. They just may not be answered until the end. Uh, the way to do this is there should be a Q&A button at the top of your screen. So you just click on that, type in your question and press send. And again, we'll do the Q&A session at the end. I will now pass over to Jen and Gregor to present the webinar. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, can everyone see that first slide? Hopefully you can. Okay, um, afternoon everyone. Um, we are excited about this webinar, but we're a little bit nervous. Um, so give us, give us one to two minutes. And I'll hand over to Gregor. Um, you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Jen Armand. Um, I'm a behavioural ecologist by background, but I've been working for Natural England for 10 years now. Um, I started off in, in local delivery, um, looking after protected sites in Norfolk, and then I did um, a spell in head office uh, kind of policy roles for a few years. And this is my most recent job um, as a programme manager for district level licensing. Um, and it certainly has been my most challenging, but also it's the most exciting job that I've had so far um, in Natural England. Okay, so I'm just going to give Gregor a, a chance to say a few words about himself, and then we'll move on. Jen, sorry. Um, just so you know, we cannot see the slides to the webinar. Okay. I think, yeah, it's just a case of sharing the screen. Hang on a second. Yeah. Good job we hadn't gone past. Uh... Right. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Great. Okay. <coughs> Well, we didn't miss anything exciting, it's just a title slide. Right, so I told you a little bit about myself. Um, Gregor? Hello, I'm Gregor Neve. Um, so I work for Natural England in the District Licensing Team. I'm a technical lead in the team, but I'm a consultant ecologist by training. I spent um, about eight years in consultancy, came into Natural England a couple of years ago um, with a focus on innovation in protected species licensing in particular. 
Um, so I've worked on projects um, that are now on Great Britain. Great. All right. Thank you, Gregor. Um, so um, my job, so often my job is to talk about the overall programme of district level licensing and the and the, the progress that we're making with it. Um, and we will come back to that towards the, uh, the end of this webinar. But what we really wanted to focus on today was um, using the, the Natural England led scheme um, as an example, and there are others out there, but using the Natural England led scheme as an example to kind of describe what district level licensing is, so um, why it's come about, um, the design of, our, um, of the scheme that we're operating, um, and, and how to use it. Um, and the sort of the message that we'd like to sort of get, one of the messages is um, how we've been precaution into every stage of the scheme design. And, and finally, I hope it will be able to um, describe, describe the sort of the scope and the opportunity for, uh, for conservation that it represents. So that's what I'm hoping we'll, we will be able to get across today and you can let us know if we're successful or not. Um, so, and, and then the sort of the final point before I hand over to um, Gregor is we're, we're conscious that we're going to try to get quite a lot of information across today in this in this webinar um, and pro provide as comprehensive an overview as we can if that's not a contradiction um, but what we're conscious of is that it district level licensing it's sort of a elegantly simple um, principle um, but it's quite it's, it's proved quite complex to execute so we'd like to offer, if there is um, sufficient interest, some, some follow-up um, webinars that, that will deep dive into certain areas of the, of the project so that we can um, tell you more about those. So we might, might not be able to go into everything today or answer everyone's questions, but we will, um, we will be doing these follow-ups and, and that will provide further opportunity. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Gregor and I'll come back at the end. Hello again, I hope you can hear me. Um, so, um, I'm aware that there's probably, or hopefully, a range of attendees on the call, um, some ecologists and, and, and others too, professional ecologists and others too. Um, so I'll start from the beginning um, and do an introduction to, to where we are at the moment in traditional licensing. So Great Chris and Newts are relatively widespread in England, but they've declined um, dramatically um, over the past 60 years. Um, and and, and part of the, partly because of that, the European Protected Species um, and will still be uh, after Brexit. Um, and it's illegal to capture, kill, injure, or disturb great grizzly newts or damage their habitat um, without a license. So the current approach to licensing um, is for uh, site mitigation strategies. Um, so you do some survey, um, and that leads into designing a mitigation strategy that normally involves fencing, um, hundreds of meters, sometimes thousands, of plastic fencing in the ground, trapping, translocation, um, and creating um, habitat on that particular site. It invo translocation involves moving newts to, um, to receptor sites. Um, and you can see on the screen here, this is an example of one. Um, and they're often, uh, well, they, they always are designed in good faith, but they quite often become suboptimal um, due to a lack of management and future planning. So we've had a look to see what's spent on, on the traditional approach and, and how, how effective this is. So the money spent um, on the traditional licensing approach may outstrip that spent on habitat creation and management um, by seven to one um, uh, approximately. Um, and we're finding that resources are concentrated on individual sites um, to prevent losses, um, but at the same time, um, landscape scale, great Christian populations continue to decline. So we're trying to think of um, a new approach to improve on the situation. Um, so the, pro the approach to, that district licensing revolves around is habitat. And the Natural England led approach in particular, it's ponds. Um, and so you can see here you've got ponds in the middle. What we want to do with Great Crested Newts um, and, dist and district licensing is, is to have more ponds, have them good quality, um, make them in the right places to so improve connectivity. Make sure there's funding and a mechanism to secure long-term monitoring and management, and then to put them in the right places, so in, in those strategic locations. 
And from our modeling, and we'll come on to modeling a bit later, it seems to show that ponds um, where you've got good habitat, a terrestrial habitat, seem to be the limiting factor for newts. If you can put ponds in the right places, um, the newts should come. And, and this falls in line with um, uh, the review, which most of you will be familiar with, by John Lawton in 2010, of more, bigger, better, joined up. And this is trying to, um, it's off the back of that. Um, so we start, the starting point for this was conservation. Um, and so we're trying to improve new conservation. But to be able to get a scheme up and running, we have to make it better for the for customers, those who use the system. Um, we may all on here be familiar with people who are, are unhappy with the system at the moment and think it could be improved. So this is one way to do that. So the aim is, is to have it simple and quick um, to apply for and use a license. Um, no time, time constraints for works um, and to enable better forward planning. So um, developers have, have told us and, and ecologists too that it's certainty from the start, which is one of the most important things. Um, having a fixed cost known at an early stage, and that can be even before you've bought that plot of land, you can come to Natural England for an inquiry and find out how much it might cost to use district licensing. So you have an idea of what it will cost at an early stage and plan accordingly. And then there's no risk of delay um, due to weather or staff or change of plans, etc. cetera. Um, and, we, and again, those of us who've been involved in traditional licensing would have um, seen those times where, where you're trying to get those last trapping days in at the end of, at the, end of the winter and that sort of thing. Um, get around that. So, so far, we've got um, the Natural England Ed approach to district licensing operates in Cheshire and Kent, um, and it's been operating for a few months now, and, and already we've had some, some satisfied customers, and there's a quote here at the bottom. Um, I won't read it, because my, my head will get a bit big, um, but you can read it here. And we've got, uh, we're, we're trying to improve the system all the time, so we're not pretending that it's perfect at the moment, but it is, it's working and we're improving it. Um, Day to day. So there's two ways to do district licensing. Um, the first way is the way we'd, we'd envisaged from the start, which is essentially um, issuing an organisational license to a local planning authority or, or another party, um, and then they can authorise developers um, to, to use uh, that license. So this operates in the Woking in Woking in the Woking pilot and Nature Space Partnership are a, a private enterprise, they administer an organisational licensing scheme, digital licensing scheme um, in the South Midlands and have just extended that as well. We like to term it the, the South Midlands extension. So today we're talking about the Natural England Ed scheme and that's slightly different. Um, so the approach, to, the way one is where all three licensing tests are assessed at plan level and at the moment in Kent and Cheshire um, we're assessing the FCS test favourable conservation status test um, at, a, at plan level um, and at the moment we uh, we ask for a reason statement to come in to, so the IROP, the sort of the, the need and the NSA which is no satisfactory alternative test can be can be satisfied but we're, we're working to try and improve that and make that more strategic as we go but at the moment that's how it works um, in the natural England led scheme. So we're, we're issuing in individual licenses to developers rather than organizing developers who work under a, a, a sort of an umbrella license. So that's potentially a bit of a dry bit. Um, one of the most exciting bits for me um, is, uh, is, this, is the data that we're managing to, to get from this. So we've got funding from the Ministry for Housing Communities and Local Government, MHCLG, and that's enabled us to do Surveys of approximately 5,000 ponds around England, which is really exciting using eDNA and all those surveys are done now and they're in and we're just um, crunching the data. Um, we've also managed to mine um, approximately 27,000 class license records and so uh, people who, you, uh, who survey under a Natural England class license um, submit the records of where they found newts to us. Um, and we look after those records. And, and this is one of the first times where we've managed to mine them out in, in a big way. And most excitingly of all, there's a little picture at the bottom of the slide, and you can see that it, it shows the Natural England's Open Data Geo Portal. And this is a portal where you can get spatial information um, where, where we make it freely available. So most of the 5,000 ponds surveyed across England are available at the moment. 
The ones from this year haven't been put on yet, but will be shortly. Um, and again, most of the 27,000 class license records are, will be on there. So we've collected other data from local stakeholders too, where they hold it. So wildlife trusts, um, RSPB or local record centres, people like that. Um, and then almost all of our data will be uh, open access. And that, so we have an open access um, policy um, naturally, and this, this falls into that. So on the next slide, you can see this is an approximation of where we've done our surveys. This is an indicative map um, showing where district licensing will be rolled off, uh, rolled, <laughs> rolled out. Um, it is indicative, um, so don't take it red, but it shows you roughly where we've been doing our surveys and when. So all that data um, has allowed us to do modelling, um, which is another exciting project because we can start to do um, species distribution models. And so the models we're using for the natural England approach to district licensing, um, we've, we've made predict where known great and new ponds are or records are 95% of the time. And so we've used those distribution models to underpin um, risk maps and what we call uh, strategic opportunity area maps, SOAs. The risk maps we've divided into three, three zones, red, amber and green. And so red are the best places in a county for great crystal newts and we wouldn't expect district licensing to be available in those red areas. Amber are the areas where GCN are likely to be present and green are areas where GCN are unlikely. We'll see an example of the map in a minute. And, we, and our SOA maps, they're, they're targeting maps. They provide um, uh, an overview of the best places to create and restore ponds for Great Britain. So on the next slide, we've got the risk zone map for Cheshire. And you can see there's four red zones there. And you can see there's um, quite a lot of amber and some green. Um, Cheshire and Kent are quite newty places. And uh, the licensing burden there is quite high. And so we might expect those places to be to be more amber than other places. Um, it's, it's worth noting that this map and the, and this next map too, the opportunity area map, are also available on the, um, the Open Data Geo portal. So you can download the shape files from that and open it up in GIS. Um, so this is the opportunity areas map. It um, it it's, it'll be used by our habitat delivery bodies, and we'll come on to them later. Target where to deliver habitat in a place. So you've got um, pink areas and blue areas. And pink areas we um, are core areas. So if you put a pond there in the right place, it's likely to um, make that population that's there more resilient, population of Great Christian Newts more resilient, um, and boost its population. We've got our blue areas, and they are the places where there's, there's good terrestrial habitat, but the, the limiting factor is probably ponds in those places. So if you put there, you can expand out from those core pink areas um, and so increase the, the amount of available habitat for newts and also increase increase their distribution potentially their range as well so we've um, we've looked at the data and the modeling um, how do you use it how do you use district licensing or the natural England approach to district licensing so again we wanted to make simplicity quite high on the agenda for this Simple steps. I hope they're simple. Um, so, you, uh, if you pretend to be an applicant, you make an inquiry um, to Natural England, and you want to confirm whether you can use district licensing um, and how much it will cost. Um, so, step two, Natural England will come back to you with a quotation, um, which will say if say whether you can use district licensing, um, and if you can, um, how much it will cost. So, you've got a quote, um, and then if you're happy to proceed. Um, you can, or your or your client, um, can sign that quote, and then that forms a, a contract between Natural England and yourself um, that you can use district licensing. And so, importantly, that certificate can be given for uh, planning permission, and so you can use that to inform your planning your planning application. So instead of having to do surveys um, and provide a mitigation strategy, you can use a certificate in place. So if all goes well, you'll get um, your planning permission um, and then you, we can grant the license at that stage and after um, you've paid a fee. 
And we'll come to the, to the um, conservation payment a bit later, but we'll um, carry on a bit of, of the, uh, the, the customer journey. So we've got a flow diagram here. Um, and so it's two routes through the Natural England approach to district licensing. So if we start at the top box, um, so you're eligible to, to, to use district licensing probably if, if you're not in a, in a red risk zone. There might be other caveats too, but let's, let's pretend you are eligible. And so we start um, venturing off um, down one of these spokes. So if we go down um, the left-hand side as you're looking at it, um, the survey spoke. So we are able, or you, you as an applicant, are able to choose to either survey a site, in which case we use that information to, um, to understand the impact, um, or not to survey, in which case we use our modelling to understand what the impact is. So if you choose to do survey, um, we expect you to provide your pond layer um, in, in GIS format, saying where the ponds that you've surveyed are, where the ponds that you haven't been able to survey for access or health and safety or something like that are, and also which of those ponds had newts in, didn't have newts in, etc. So that's similar to the, to the current approach in terms of the, the submitting your information to us, but it's the way we deal with it changes. So we have an impact assessment tool and we can calculate the impact accordingly. And so you'll see at the bottom of that, of that route, you'll see um, three boxes coming off it. Um, ponds occupied, ponds not occupied, ponds not accessed. And each of those has a different compensation multiplier. So if you have one pond on your site um, or within 250 meters that has uh, newts in it, and we expect uh, the equivalent of four new ponds or restored ponds um, as compensation. If you've got a pond on your site, if your site's got newts on and you but you've got a pond and you've shown that it's not occupied by great greater newts, then there's a compensation multiplier of one. And if you haven't been able to access a pond for survey, then there's a compensation multiplier of two. And we'll come on to the impact assessment in detail in a minute. But I'll go down the, the other side, the no survey route. Uh, so that's the right hand spoke. And so we can there, if you if you choose not to survey, um, whether that's the time constraints or, or there's just a choice made, then we can use our internal systems, our, our modeling essentially, to, to, to calculate or estimate the impact. So that's where the risk zone map comes in. And you can see, so we, you would send us your uh, outline, um, your, your red line boundary, your development boundary, um, and, and we'd uh, overlay that onto the um, risk zone map. And if any, even a tiny part of that touches an amber zone, and then the compensation multiplier will be two. So however many ponds are on your site or, or within 250 meters, the compensation multiplier would be two. And if it's in, entirely in the green zone, then the multiplier would be one. And so we'll move on to the next slide, which explains it in a little bit more detail. So we're gonna have a look at the impact. This is, this is, this is the impact assessment. Um, the impact is quantified as the number of ponds impacted by development. And so you'll see here you've got a, um, a perfectly circular development boundary, a red line boundary, and in it there's one pond. And whether that pond is retained as part of the scheme design or not, um, we count it in our impact assessment as lost. And then you've got um, a 250 meter buffer around that development site, that's indicated by the dotted red line, and you've got one pond, as an example, in that, um, in that buffer. And then we apply a 250 meter buffer around that pond. And that shows us um, 250 meters is the, is the amount, of, is the, the normal dis dispersal distance, the way you define most newts dispersing from a, from a breeding pond. And so any terrestrial habitat within 250 meters of a pond might be important for newts. So you want to know how much of that habitat will be impacted by that development. And you can see that orange shaded bit shows us that that bit, the terrestrial habitat associated with that offsite pond is likely to be impacted by development. In fact, we get, from that, we're able to calculate the proportion um, and we'll come on to how we've done that in a minute. On this next slide, you have to bear with me because it gets a bit busy, um, but we've, again, we've got our, um, let's take the example a bit further from before. You've got your circular um, development boundary and you've got a number of ponds in and around it. Um, and so there's two ponds uh, within the boundary 
And so we automatically count that in our impact assessment as two ponds lost. So, uh, the next bit, we've got a 250 meter buffer applied to that development boundary, that's the black dotted line. And we can see the three ponds fall within that, um, within that uh, buffer, and one pond lies without the buffer. Um, and so three ponds would fall into our impact assessment. And then we do as we did before, we apply a 250 meter uh, buffer around those ponds and we see how those buffers interact with the development boundary. Um, and, then, um, and so you can see here, um, portions of habitat available to newts associated with those ponds that will be affected or impacted by development. So in this example, We've got 19% of the total available terrestrial habitat is lost or impacted by development. And then you times that percentage by three, because um, that's the number of ponds. Um, and so that becomes 0 0.57 as a fraction. We round that up to be precautionary um, to the nearest 0 0.1. So you've got 0 0.6 is your impact for offsite ponds. So in your impact ass assessment, um, you then add that to your on-site impact, which is two. So you get a, a, an overall impact, for this particular example, of 2.6. I hope that makes sense. So the next bit is to then apply the, um, the risk zones. And the green and the amber bits on this slide are meant to show that this um, development falls and, and straddles uh, an amber and a green zone. And so we know our impact, which is 2.6. So we then apply the compensation multiplier, which is, uh, which is 2, because it touches the number zone. So, you, so for this particular development, you would need to provide 5.2 or equivalent of compensation funds. So we move on to what does 5.2 funds really mean in terms of cost? And what does it mean about habitat in the ground? So, Every compensation pond costs £15,165 plus fat. Um, every license costs £690, and there's no VAT um, applicable to that. So the total payment is calculated as £670 for an inquiry fee, plus the number of compensation ponds times um, £15,000 approximately, uh, plus £690 license fee. And you can see in that table that it's broken down habitat delivery, habitat monitoring and administration and 85% um, of that um, budget goes towards habitat delivery and monitoring which is what we wanted. We wanted, we wanted habitat in the ground and for that to be secured and monitored and maintained over time, over 25 years um, and then but there's, there is as always um, a bit left over for, for administration of the team. On the next slide um, is an example of, oh, there's two examples we've picked out to, to show a cost comparison where we had the data to do the comparison. So there's two sites, relatively different, um, one's bigger and one's smaller, and you can see there the two bottom rows, um, um, the, the, the penultimate row, um, that, that, that slightly larger development would have cost about £62,000 to do to use a traditional approach, and this is based on what the ecologist um, predicted. Um, and about 16% of that would have gone for habitat delivery. Whereas if additional licensing had been used, a similar amount would have been payable, but 85% of that would have been on habitat delivery. Um, and it would have been uh, much quicker um, and there would have been certainty right from the start. And it's a similar scenario in, the, in that second example, except in, in that scenario, additional licensing would have been about um, two thirds cheaper. This is another example. Um, I hope I'm not going on too quickly. It's, it's, it's difficult when I'm not seeing people in front of me. But this is another example worked through. And you may have seen this um, on the internet. We've, we've blogged about it as Natural England. And this is a site called Chilmington Green. Um, it was originally part of a traditional license uh, master plan. So it was part of a phase development. But this particular phase, they wanted to change tack and, and use digital licensing. And they have chosen to do it. And they've been pleased about it. The developers have been pleased about it. So the license was granted, um, this is an important point, on outline permission. 
licensing is able to to operate on outline permission um, and not necessarily just for full permission, which is the current approach um, in most cases. Um, so that there's indirect impact of off-site ponds only. So there's no ponds on site, um, but the um, through what we've just been through, the impact assessment and the costing, it, it funded the equivalent of 4.5 compensation ponds, um, and that includes their monitoring and management for 25 years. So that's four and a half ponds, or four ponds in the ground, and five waiting to, to have the, the, the net funding for the, the last half of it to go in the ground. So that's really exciting for me to, to see some habitat actually go. You'll see a, um, a lovely photograph of our of our chair, Tony Juniper, uh, and also John Shelton, um, who works for the Countryside Management Partnership in Kent. Um, and this, this was Tony going on a site visit and, um, and John showing off the good work that he's done there. This is uh, ponds and an illustration. This was, um, when I, I, I made this diagram up and someone said to me, well, it's, it's Gregor, show me again the pool ball uh, illustration and so it's on a life of its own, but here we go. So this is to try and illustrate um, Again, another exciting bit of the project in terms of the, the scope of habitat delivery that we're doing or pond delivery. So in the those those of you who are eagle-eyed enough to to spot in the in the um, cost breakdown, the fact that that, that fifteen thousand pound figure included all the money for for compensation ponds, um, management and monitoring, etc. But you may have seen that it was not just the compensation pond that was paid for, but also a contingency pond. So it isn't just, even though you might need one pond, it does it, it ends up being two ponds in the ground. And we will try and run through how that works here. So you've got development A comes into a into a place and they would like to use district licensing. And there they need one pond as part of that. So their impact um, is or, or their compensation requirement is one. But that actually equals two ponds in the ground. Um, because you've got your compensation pond and your contingency pond. You can see that that's been allocated to um, development A. Development B comes along, which is the orange pond. They also need to provide one pond as compensation, but included in their fee is, is, a, is, um, is contingency. They've actually, it, it ends up being two ponds in the ground. But we allocate the pond that was delivered earlier on by development A to development B. So development B still funds and, and essentially delivers two ponds, but um, the pond that they require was dug a few months earlier by development A, and so that pond was, is allocated to, to development B. And when development C comes along, which are the green, green ponds, and they need a bit more. They need two ponds. So that, that equals four ponds in the ground with compensation and contingency taken into account of. And so the, the ponds that were funded by development B are allocated to development C. It goes on. Um, so development D comes along, they're the purple ponds, they also need two ponds and they're allocated. But, so they provide four ponds in the ground and they're allocated two of those. And you can see that this becomes a rolling stock of ponds. So those ponds that are provided as contingency don't linger in the ground. Um, they're, they're used and funding is applied to those so for, for monitoring, maintenance, management, applied to those relatively quickly, probably within a year for, for most cases. Uh, but then we've got a rolling stock of ponds which allows us to bring more people into the scheme because one of the limiting factors of district licensing is pump priming the scheme, is getting ponds in the ground to enact, so we can have um, compensation ahead of impact. So the next slide is um, what happens when ponds fail? This comes reason for the contingency ponds. So we're not in, entering into legal agreements with landowners on on the land where we're digging our pond. What we're doing is is they're they're entering into an informal agreement with us and our habitat delivery bodies to allow the delivery bodies to go and put the ponds in the ground and also monitor and maintain them. But we felt that it would be too onerous and would and would put landowners off if we required them to enter into legal agreements. And we wanted to put more money into conservation rather than into lawyers' pockets um, developing um, legal agreements around this. So we thought, well, how, what's an alternative method? So we thought, well, how about if we had a spare pot for every pond that we had as compensation? How about if we had a spare pond? So if every compensation pond failed, um, we'd have a spare one. 
So this is what we've done, and that's where the contingency funds come in. So you've got our uh, A, A, B, C, and D developments. So pond, the pond that was allocated to development B fails for some reason. It might be that it doesn't hold water. It might be that it gets polluted for some reason. And it can be any, any number of, of, of reasons. Um, so that fails. That's that red dotted line. And you can see that disappears. So we then, at that point, we reallocate one of our contingency ponds to development B. And you can see that's one of the one of the um, ah, it's supposed to be on there, but it's supposed to be green. And then you can see the same thing happens. Another red dotted line appears around that one of the ponds allocated to development C, but that gets reallocated. Um, one of the contingency ponds gets reallocated as a compensation pond for for that lost pond. So you can see we've got a roll stock so we can have 100% failure and, and still allocate some fair ponds as we go along. So when we're talking about ponds, um, what do we really mean? Um, what does a pond look like? So we've tried to be as, as, as strict as we can. We've taken um, evidence from, from other similar projects from Freshwater Habitats Trust, from Million Ponds Project and, and other places too to see well what, what design of pond should we have? And actually, the more we look at it, the more we realise that ponds, that newts can use um, different types of ponds um, across the landscape um, and for different reasons. And it's good to have a different type of pond. So, so we're relatively, we, we have a set of, uh, of, of guidelines, but relatively loose in terms of, of, of what the pond might look like. Um, so the pond location is, is targeted using the SOA maps. So um, if you're going to put a pond in the ground, it should be in a strategic opportunity area. But then it's it's um, so the pond location is is targeted using the um, refine so that uh, we're working so in in Cheshire. For, Sorry, Gregor, we can't hear you anymore. Your audio keeps cutting out. Is, is that any better? Yes, yeah, we can hear you now. Would you mind sorry. repeating that? Yes, I'd love to. <laughs> Thank <laughs> um, you. Sorry, sorry. Everyone in Cheshire East, we're working a contract with us to deliver stability, to use the targeting level. Is this a sensible place to put a pond? And so they go through a check. Can you hear me as well? Actually, things start to happen. We start to, to, to have ponds across the landscape. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's happening. I think um, your voice is overlapping. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's quite strange. Yes, I hope this is better. Is this better? Yes, yeah, I think we're okay now. Excellent. Apologies. So, um, I'll start um, from the apologies um, if I should be. But compens so the compensation ponds, we want them to be good for you. That's, that's where we want to start from. Um, and so we're working with habitat delivery bodies um, in a place. Um, so in, in Cheshire East, for example, we're working with, with Cheshire Wildlife Trust um, really closely. And, and, and there are habitat delivery bodies. So they um, use the strategic opportunity area maps to, to target landowners and land holdings um, and to see whether they're appropriate um, for digging ponds. So if they find a willing landowner, they go to a site and do, a, and do an on the ground check to see actually, is, is this an appropriate place to dig a pond? Is it near other ponds, fragmented, all that sort of stuff? Um, and if they think it is, then we can start to dig ponds. So every pond should have a surface area of between 100 and 1,000 meters squared. Um, depth, um, will vary between a meter and three and a half meters. Um, there'll be shallow areas, um, which are um, most of us will know valuable for wildlife and, and shallow gradients on the banks. Um, and at least a three meter terrestrial habitat buffer around every pond, although we hope it will be bigger in, in many cases. Um, and also to manage that buffer as a habitat mosaic um, and install high vernacular and other features for needs in, in that buffer. Um, and then there's Within the budget available, there's there's budget for fencing every pond if it needs to be fenced, and there's pros and cons for fencing. 
situation. So again, we're relying on the habitat delivery body to use their professional judgment um, in each case, should it, should it, um, should it be or not. So one of the, the, the crux of district licensing is, is, is making sure that we're open and transparent about, about what we're doing and, and how it's working. Um, and to get some some really exciting monitoring data. So not only have we uh, managed to, to gain um, the data from the eDNA surveys around England and, and from the class licenses and other places and produce these models which have never been produced before in these places, that, that information will continue to be gathered through, um, through our monitoring. So for, for every pond, every compensation pond that's required, uh, there'll be um, funding for four eDNA and HSI surveys, um, and that will measure pond quality and colonisation. Um, three further HSI surveys and egg searches, and I've put years 8, 16 and 25 here, but actually it, it's, again, professional judgement on the habitat delivery bodies, um, uh, judgement and, and with consultation with Natural England. Um, and so that will be during um, maintenance visits over, over the 25 year period. And that will measure pond quality and breeding presence over, over a much longer period. There's also a contribution um, to, um, to PondNet, and some of you will be familiar with that. Um, and it's the equivalent of about one eDNA survey and HSI survey to PondNet, for, and this is for every pond required. Um, and that measures national trends. And so we can compare what's happening to our, our ponds that have been um, nationally. So there's a contribution to population surveys um, of a subsample of digital licensing ponds and also a subsample of existing ponds. So again, we want to work out what's going on um, in the background and compare it to what's um, happening to the ponds we're delivering as a direct result of digital licensing. And we can use that information to continuously improve um, what we're doing. We're, we already are. So it also includes a contingency eDNA and HSI survey, so a spare one. So if you go back to a, to a site and do a maintenance action, you can, you've got the opportunity to do another eDNA survey and see what's going on. So we've got uh, yearly mapping updates included, included in, in that um, budget as well, um, and regular updates of the risk maps. And as I said before, there's three maintenance visits um, and, and, and also um, costing for, for maintenance actions to make sure the ponds are valuable for GCN uh, over that long period. So to me, that's really exciting. And all that information is recorded um, online and, and um, it'll be open data. So we'll be able to use it, not just for to inform digital licensing, um, but for, for other projects too. And that's the, same, that, that's the same for the maps. We'd expect the risk zone maps to be used in forward planning by local, local planning authorities. And we'd expect these um, opportunity area maps to be used to inform things like the nature recovery network, um, green infrastructure mapping, um, potentially net gain, and all those sorts of things. So at this point, um, I'm going to pass you across to uh, Jen again. Okay. Um, thanks, Greg. I hopefully you can um, you can hear me now. I'm back on. Okay. So, so Greg has sort of run through um, the, the scheme design and how we how we've put it together, um, what the customer journey looks like, and its cost. Um, so how is that being received? Um, I said that these are um, schemes available um, in Kent and Cheshire at the moment um, and they've been live there for six months now. So, And I think you know, we've had a healthy pipeline of interest um, in, in that time. Um, so, so, so many inquiries and those are starting to translate into um, commitment to join the scheme. Um, and ultimately have um, a district level license and uh, Chilmington Green is one, one such example. It's been a really interesting six months to see what that uptake um, would be. We, it was difficult to predict um, and it's proving to be quite different in the two areas that we've got operational at the moment. So uh, in, in Kent, for example, we've got uh, probably more ap more applications to join the scheme, but of a generally sort of smaller size, um, and they have been um, you know easier to deal with in that um, it's it's uh, they're more more familiar and easier to put to put through the system that we've set up. 
in, in Cheshire, um, we've had some more um, challenging inquiries to the scheme, but potentially really exciting ones for, um, for conservation. So there's been some really large multi-phase um, scheme interests um, in Cheshire, uh, requiring yeah ten, tens of compensation ponds, and um, uh, you can you can do the maths for yourself around how that adds up for um, for habitat for great crested newts. Um, and that that last bullet point there that that demonstrates you know that shows how much um, how much habitat we've created so far across the area. So we've, um, as Gregor said, we've needed we, we needed to pump prime the scheme. So invest in habitat ahead of the scheme opening to make sure that we had that pond bank available for um, for developers to buy into. And now it's just continuing to work uh, with our habitat delivery bodies through the winter to, to try to match um, habitat delivery and, and income to the scheme with, um, with habitat. Okay, so, um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to do these two slides a different way round. So I'm just going to come to, um, so we have touched on this already, but just to put it on a slide so it's fairly clear. This is where um, district level licensing is currently available. So we mentioned the, the Woking pilot. Um, we've got natural England led schemes in operation in Kent and Cheshire. And uh, Nature Space Partnership um, are operating across seven LPAs in the South Midlands and have been doing for over a year now. And um, very recently in the last um, two months, they've, um, they've uh, secured an extension across a further nine LPAs. So at the moment, district level licensing is available across 32. Um, and the, um, the target for the project was 150 LPAs, which I'll come back to it, um, in, in just a second. But where the, what, what this progress has um, what has got us to is um, if we recognise the need to um, to publish something um, externally that uh, described the the overarching principles to which all district level licensing schemes must adhere. So we've gone through the. Um, the Kent and Cheshire model today, the Natural England-led scheme. Um, the Nature Space scheme in the South Midlands is, is similar, but um, has there are differences in terms of um, how, how they've designed their scheme and their, their, their cost, their, um, their habitat delivery. But um, regardless of those differences, all um, both schemes and the Woking scheme all adhere to these same set of principles and we wanted to put that out there in the public domain so people could see it. We published this framework document in July and it's available um, online. And, but it, it is actually coming from the perspective that um, there are different people interested in um, holding an organisational licence or operating a, a district level licensing scheme. And this document is, um, is aimed at, at at those people, those scheme designers that are interested in participating in district level licensing. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly heavy, but necessarily so, read, um, but it does, does describe those principles in quite some depth that all, all schemes need to, need to meet. And what we hope it do, does is, is sets, set the, sets the standards for, for district level licensing going forward, and it um, clearly and transparently shows where we've got to with our thinking um, around the approach. So what does the, the future hold? Um, so we are in the final year of, um, of, a, of a three year project um, and what we hope to have done by March 2020 um, Gregor described we will have complete we have completed we're just uh, crunching the data as he said completed the largest sort of baseline survey of its type for great crested newts we'll have we're going to translate that um, that, that recently collected collected data in this final year of survey into the models and then into the risk zone and strategic opportunity area maps across more than 200 local planning authority areas 
um, and we will make that um, that information available. And we'll have invested over over two million. So this is the um, the, the project money that we we got from MHCLG. We'll have invested over two million in in habitat for great crested newts to pump prime further district level licensing schemes across England. And um, some of you may be aware that we've recently um, been tendering for habitat delivery bodies. It, uh, that tender closes on Monday. Um, and that and we're seeking to establish those partnerships across those areas and and spend that money um, on pump priming schemes and we hope to launch schemes in many more areas so um, it, it won't be news that 32 is fairly short of 150 at the moment but what I hope these sort of smaller bullet points here demonstrate is that we're we're, we're getting there um, and so what, what will this all add up to? Well, um, it, it, district level licensing is cited um, in the government's environment plan. Um, it's, it's a strategic approach. It's, it's innovative. It's been um, complex to execute, but it is the, the forerunner to, um, to other important policy areas like, like net gain. And so what, what, what this project is also about is trying to um, apply what we've learned um, about district level licensing to how net gain might be delivered. And we're also interested to, um, to explore whether similar approaches could be extended to other protected species. Uh, okay, and so in, in summary then, um, I guess what what I wanted to get across um, through what, what Greg has gone through in particular um, is the amount of thought that, um, that has gone into putting this scheme together and what I think it adds up for um, in terms of conservation for great crested newts. Um, so if I just run, I'm just going to run through those, those points. Um, so he, he described the compensation ratio and that we're going to put four ponds in the ground for every pond lost regardless of whether it was lost on site or not. When we were looking at the calculation, um, uh, we've rounded up at each stage of that co um, calculation to be precautionary in calculating the, um, the, the number of compensation ponds required. We count it as being in an amber zone, even if it just, uh, just skims the edge of it. Um, so again, we're sort of, um, yeah, sort of, compensating upwards rather than downwards at every stage. We, we expect from, from the evidence that's available through agri-environment and so on that up to 40% of, um, of newly created or restored ponds may fail. So we've doubled up the number of ponds that we're creating or restoring. So we've got our compensation ponds, we've got our contingency ponds, and every 15,000 pays for two, not one. Um, we're placing those ponds in the in the areas that we've that our models show to be in the very best places for um, for great crested newts and to the to the highest pond specification that the evidence has, um, shows. And we've got money in the bank, um, secured, protected, um, separate. Um, for uh, maintaining those ponds, monitoring them um, across in for 25 years and we're making all of that data um, open and I, I guess that the final thing there is that um, you know what, what we're, we're able to do that because we're shifting the investment um, that developers are making up front and into um, into compensation habitat so 85% of the funding goes towards habitat creation, monitoring and um, maintenance. Very little on administering and we've kept that to um, as down as we can. So I hope, you know, what, what, we're, what we're getting through the approach is lots of good quality ponds in the right places and that they're going to be safeguarded over the next 25 years. Um, so I think, I think that's it. So we were going to open it up for questions now. Um, I think Christy's going to help us manage those. Yes, yep. Yeah. So we have um, 
we've got 35 questions, so we'll go through them. Um, let's start from the beginning. Uh, so we've got a question here. Is the district licensing approach likely to be equally suitable for all types of development, e.g. big, small, linear, non-linear? Um, yes, that's what we're trying to make it um, equally suitable. Um, each, but each, as you all know, each development has its own quirks. So we've had a whole range through at the moment and we're, and we're working to try and improve it for, certainly for things like um, infrastructure schemes, linear schemes. So yes, in theory, in practice, um, uh, we're trying to improve it as we go along. Fab, thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, just, um, I just want to... So, sorry, Jen, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Okay, so in, our, in the wildlife licensing newsletter that Natural England offer, um, uh, put out each month we've there's one in in this month about district level licensing and it shows a couple um a couple of examples um worked through in terms of of cost um and as gregor says we're looking to improve it uh, all the time so that it, it fits well for the medium sized at the moment we're doing a lot around the smaller schemes and, a, and, and even more, I would say, around these, um, these larger multi-phase schemes, including the linear ones. So, uh, yes, it will, it, it will fit all, but we're working on it. Great, thank you. Uh, another question here from Christopher. Have you had any indication from other nation and SNCOs that they may adopt a similar path? Yeah, um, we haven't had any indication. I've been really keen to talk to the um, the other SNCOs. Um, I know they're aware of it. Um, I think, I've, I mean, Great Crested Mute Ecology is not my expertise, but I understand, you know, the, the pressure um, in, in Wales and Scotland, um, for example, it will be much less so i don't think it's as high on their on their list of priorities as it has been for england um but i certainly if um if they wanted to roll out something similar then i'd be really happy to share what we've done with them great thank some, you. Oh. In, in wales there are some, some strategic schemes um uh in operation already but not district licensing as, as we've discussed here Okay, thank you. Uh, another one from Dawn. Uh, it's quite a long one. I have recently had an inquiry for DLL rejected in Cheshire East, uh, despite the council wanting to also use this approach for my, my particular site. Due to the lack of new ponds having been created within that particular 10 kilometre grid square, rejection for an approach that I have recommended to a client left, therefore equals no certainty. How do Natural England intend to overcome this issue? Yeah, so um, that is, that's a good point and one we've been trying to, to grapple with. So it comes back to that priming of ponds. We, we want to make sure that there's enough ponds in the ground to be able to allocate to developers. So um, that needs more and, and we were already aware of that. So it also shows that um, we're, we're targeting certain grid squares so one kilometre or ten kilometre grid squares, and, and we're, we're able to look by the, the strategic nature of this scheme means we're able to look at the allocations, the local plan allocations over over the life of a local plan, and and overlay that onto our um, distribution model and see um, what effect that's going to have um, right up front. Um, and so and by by doing that, you can automatically see where the pinch points are going to be. So for in this instance. Um, there's a 10 kilometer square where a lot of development happens to fall in that one square. You know, um, we could have chosen anywhere in Cheshire East to develop, um, but that one square is being hit very hard. And, and under our current approach, we feel it right to put the compensation back in that particular grid square in that situation. Um, and so that's where the limitation comes. It's, um, so we've got, we have got quite a lot of ponds throughout Cheshire, um, but we're trying to get more ponds in that grid square. So I can, I apologise to Dawn um, that she's had that, that she hasn't had the certainty that we might have wanted, um, but we are working on it at the moment with Cheshire Wildlife Trust. Um, we're, they're working with us to try specifically to get ponds in, in probably the grid square you're talking about. 
and and I would just add to that and be and be completely open with everybody on the call. So we we are in the first six months of this scheme. We had um, money from MHCLG, as we said, to to pump prime uh, the scheme in, in Kent in Cheshire. It's it was di it's difficult to know how much to pump prime ahead of opening, especially when they were sort of the first areas that we were operating and make sure that we've got sufficient um, investment available for other areas when we launch there. So um, we've, we've had to balance that, that upfront investment and, um, and now we, you know, we, we, need to, we need to get in a more strategic space with our habitat delivery body with Cheshire Wildlife Trust in this case um, to make sure that that, um, that pond bank, that sort of um, bank of habitat for um, uh, for your clients to buy into is is there um so we yeah we, we we are aware of that issue it's it's very specific it's that is the only sort of 10 kilometer grid square that's been an issue across kent and cheshire um and it's for the reasons that gregor said great thank you both um another question what information do you need to provide to provide to get a quote so um, it's relatively minimal and, and it depends what route you come down. So if you choose um, the, the non-survey route, um, it's just a, a red line boundary of your site um, in GIS, in a, as a shape file in GIS. Um, and if you come down the survey route, it's the same thing plus survey information within 250 metres of that site. So showing where the ponds are, which ponds were surveyed and not, and which ponds had newts in and which didn't. So that, that information is available, I should say, um, on gov.uk. Um, if you, I think if you Google district level licensing for Great Crested Newts, one of the hits will take you to gov.uk. And the, that, the information about what you need to send in to us should be there. Um, and if you've got any further questions, there, there's also a, a mailbox that we use that you can ask those questions. Thank you. Um, Mary asks, is there a difference in cost between the two routes? It depends, um, and that's what we found as we've been looking through. Um, so it's it's not it's not designed to make one route more expensive and the other route not. Um, so you can you can choose choose to survey, and if you survey, you might find there are no newts on your site, in which case that would have probably been a good use of money um, for of, for that developer. Um, or you might find newts are in one pond out of ten, uh, in which case in that particular scenario it would have been it would probably be cheaper to do have done the survey it, it we're talking about an eDNA survey not not population size class to do that survey um, and, and find that level of occupancy as, as opposed to going down the no survey route but contrary to that you could find that all your ponds are occupied in which case it would have been the right decision to go down the no survey route but essentially you'll never know until you choose to do the survey and so it's um it, it as those professional ecologists on the phone um, it, it, it'll be up to you to advise your clients of the pros and cons of each of those approaches they uh, a developer will stand to save quite a considerable amount of money by surveying and, find, and finding needs to be absent um, as is the case with trad traditional licensing um, but they must also be aware that you know it, that the cost will vary depending on whether they've got survey information or not I hope that answers it that's great thank you um, okay, another question. What's the benefit for surveying our own pond layer when we can just do no survey? Surely surveying is more time consuming and costly. Yeah, so, so off the back of the, the last question, it's a, it's a similar answer. Um, it, it's, it depends on the situation. Okay. I think it's also about about choice. So we're, you know, um, in some cases, survey has information is already available, um, and we we didn't want to that to prohibit people joining the district level licensing scheme. Um, as as um, as it becomes more widely available, more familiar, um, and we're we're further ahead with the scheme, it it might be that. Um, that, that more people choose the, the no survey route, um, but we needed both both options to be available to uh, to customers and to make sure that the overall compensation ratio that we achieved was the same regardless of um, of the route that they came in um, to the scheme via. 
Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Robert. For the survey option, to what distance from the application boundary do ponds need to be surveyed? That's uh, 250 metres. Great, thank you. Um, Patrick asks, what is the incentive to use a survey approach? It costs more to do surveys and if you find GCN you have to compensate times four. I think we've already answered that that one. It's yeah. about um, it's about options and um, yeah, professional judgment. Are you both able to see the Q and A? Yeah, can, yeah, we can. We okay, can. if we've answered any, would you mind um, pressing dismiss and then yeah, I don't repeat. <laughs> okay, is that okay? Is it answer by text because we can't see a dismiss button? I would. Uh, yeah, answer live would be fine if you click on that one. Okay. Fab, thank you. Just because we, yeah, I think we've got about 60, 64 questions. Um, <laughs> quite a lot to get through. Um, Neil asks, there is a lower compensation multiplier for developers choosing the no survey option. This will promote the norm for developers to not undertake surveys or worse. They will conduct surveys but only declare results when this will be financially beneficial. Are there any mecha mechanisms in place to tackle this? Yeah, good point. It's one we're asked quite a lot. Um, and again, it falls into the, the bracket of the last question for the first half of the answer. We're not trying to incentivize or disincentivize survey or no survey at all. We were offering choice. But the last part of that question, a mechanism um, to, to protect against it, against people lying, it's, it's a very similar position to what we are at the moment. We're relying on developers normally with their consultants um, to tell us the right information about newts. When we're considering license applications, we're entirely reliant on the truthfulness of developers and their consultants. So that there isn't an, ex you know, we're not doing anything different with district licensing in that respect. But we do have some mechanisms um, for compliance built in um, to be able to check on it. Um, so we're confident that we can check. And, it, and it's worth remembering that um, uh, compliance is funded now. You know, we're charging for licensing, and so we. There's, there's two mechanisms here. One is through the specific charge for licensing, but also uh, separately but related, we're, we're, we'll be looking and checking back on the performance of fishery licensing through that £15,000 fund as well. So there's there's quite a few options open to us to check that, um, that the right thing is happening as opposed to the wrong thing. Fab, thank you. Um, Christopher asks, why are retained ponds considered lost and why would anyone survey if they can default to the model? So yeah, the, the last the last point is answered um, already. Um, and why retained ponds are considered lost is because we're taking a precautionary approach, and and also it simplifies the way we do the impact assessment. There's many options that we could take to do this. Um, we need to make it the, the simplest and the most workable, and so that that's the decision we've taken. Okay. Um, one of the first slides said that there was no time constraint on development works does this mean developers will be allowed to carry out works e.g filling in ponds during high risk periods such as gcn breeding season so we have developer guidance um so developers who are using district license, the natural england approach for district licensing um they'll be sent and their ecologists will be sent guidance um to work under um, and so um, again, being in, a, in an open and transparent way, yes, they can operate. Um, they won't be seasonally constrained, um, but that developer guidance is there for them to use um, and for the ecologists to use um, where necessary. Great, thank you. Um, what is the time period to decide whether the pond has failed or succeeded before allocating it to a particular development? Yeah, good question. Um, and so um, the, the habitat delivery body will um, dig that pond and record the information uh, live on an online pond tracker. And then they go back after three months um, and if they're in the right season, they, they, they subject it to an, an eDNA survey, an HSI survey, if it's appropriate to do so, or do a, a thing that we call a, a, a pond check. It does it hold water um, and so if, if the pond is in the ground um, and it holds water um, then we can allocate it to development but we're not saying at that point that it's valuable for great crystal newts um, but we're saying that it like it will likely be in the future 
So there's, uh, as I think some of these questions are alluding to, there is a time delay from the time you dig a pond to when it becomes suitable for breeding newtons. And so looking at the, the, the research and the literature available, um, it seemed a year seems to be a good approximation of that time. And so if we allocate a pond that's in the ground, but is less than a year old, we add on an extra 1.1 um, multiplier, so an extra 10% um, onto the compensation that's required. And that's to account for um, that, that uncertainty and that, that, that potential for impact ahead of risk. Great, thank you. Um, a question here from Nick. Uh, all the fees appear to be based on based only on pond loss. Is there any consideration of loss of terrestrial value, i.e. if a developer doesn't lose any ponds but directly impacts functionally functioning linked terrestrial habitat, there doesn't seem to be any mechanism for compensatory costs there. Clearly, if terrestrial habitat is lost, there is an impact to the F CS of the population that will remain in the area but outside the land being developed. Yeah, so that Chilmington Green example in the presentation um, uh, showed an example of that. So no, no ponds were on, were within that red line boundary and so no ponds would be directly impacted. The impacts were assessed on the terrestrial habitat of the ponds off-site that would be affected by, um, by that development. Um, I hope that makes sense. So we, that's why I tried to include those um, those examples to try and to try and show that. Um, so yeah, we, right. so the, the short the short answer is we are we are, we are accounting for loss of terrestrial habitat for offsite ponds. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Christopher asks: Are developers entering the scheme early early on disadvantaged by taking? A greater burden of the contingency pond costs than those that follow. No, no, they're not. That's the simple answer to that. It's the same. It's the same price regardless of um, of what to, of what point you enter the scheme. Ooh. Okay. Thank you. Oh, quite a long one here. Um, if there is no requirement to trap and translocate newts in amber and green areas, is there not a real danger that under the DLL approach, ponds could be destroyed and GCM populations negatively affected before the compensation ponds have been occupied? This could cause a decline in newt populations if the rate of the pond destruction and development is a is greater than the rate of newt population dispersal and pond colonization, especially if the compensation and contingency ponds are a reasonable distance away from the development site. I know you mentioned that Natural England are trying to get ahead with creating the compensation ponds before the development begins, but would this period not need to be several years? So again, yeah, we touched on this um, a minute ago. So we tried to deal with that in, in several ways. Um, I, um, I'll probably miss out some of them, but the yeah. ones that come to mind on this call, um, to start with, we're delivering loads of ponds. Um, we can't underestimate that, loads and loads of ponds across the landscape. And so that's the various reasons, but, it, but it, it builds in some protection against that. So you're losing one pond that had needs in it, for example, and you'll be getting four um, newly created or restored ponds um, in, in its place. And so that, that should be a good thing. Um, and, and, and those ponds are secured in the long term. That pond that was lost probably wouldn't have had any, any sort of mechanism to secure it, to secure its future. So even if that development hadn't happened to it and it was left in, 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 a, in a field, it, it's likely to, to fill in over time um, or per, be purposely filled in to, to gain space. Um, that's, that's a bonus, I think. Of, there's also the time lag multiplier. So we, we think... Um, a, a year is, is enough to wait before, before that new pond or restored pond becomes suitable for breeding newts. So that's to have um, all the right conditions, good water, better water quality, um, macrophyte cover, shading, all those sorts of things. And so when we are allocating uh, ponds to development, if they are less than a year old, we, we include a time lag multiplier of 10%. And there's, there's other protections um, built in too, but th those are, those are the, the obvious ones. Thank you. Um, just bearing in mind the time and that we have 69 questions still left to answer. Um, are you both happy to still carry on? 
Uh, yeah, we can carry on for for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you just let me know when when to stop. Um, I think we'll need to stop by two. Okay. No problem. So, and apologies if I do repeat any that's been answered. Um, just going through them now. Uh, Kim says the math maths is like slightly confusing. Does Natural England do this or the applicant? Can you hear me, Christy? Yes. Yeah. Ah, good. Um, so it's Natural England does the does the maths. <laughs> is, is the is the is the answer so that's the inquiry that comes to us you, you provide that information that red line boundary and any other information that you want to pr provide if you've done the survey um, and then we do the impact assessment then we provide um you as the applicant um with a certificate with the outcome of that impact assessment and the quotation so it's then your choice whether to proceed with that or not okay thank you um she also, Kim also asks, well, why only available in some areas? We, um, the, the project was, um, was originally set up to roll out district level licensing across 150 LPAs. What, what drove the selection of that 150 was, um, was where previously the most historic traditional licensing activity had been, so where the greatest pressures were, I guess, and um, and trying to roll out a strategic solution across those areas first um, before considering other areas. So, that, so that's what the, the project was set up for originally. We've extended it to uh, more, than, more than 200. We've surveyed more than 200 and we hope that it will be available in, in more than the 150 areas. But that's, that's due to how the LPAs wish to work together um, rather than um how the original project was set up to do great thank you um guy asks having received fees in excess of a hundred thousand for a single house development we are cautious to recommend the service to our smaller clients is there opportunity to release a calculator so that we would inform our clients of costs before they need to pay the 700 quote fee Hi, Guy. Um, we, we're, we're not likely to uh, release the calculator, but as I said in the, in the Wildlife Licensing Newsletter um, this, this, this month, we have um, released some more information about how we calculate um, the conservation payment and with a couple of worked examples um, to, to help explain how we, how we come up with those figures. In addition, as I said, we are, um, we are looking at how district level licensing works for um, for for every size of development. We've um, identified some improvements that we can make to our um, to smaller developments coming through, and um, and and those are um, are are effective from now. And as I say, we're also looking at the the bigger end of the spectrum and what we can do there to improve the scheme. So it's a it, it is a. Um, a we are in a continuous improvement phase with this so um uh, don't dismiss us on the back of one great thank you um robert asks will the survey data co collected be available on the nbn gateway um that's a good question it's actually uh i need to double check that in theory yes so it will be available on the natural england open data geo portal and in theory it'll be available on mbn but that's uh bumps me slightly so we'll, we'll we'll get back to you on that one thank you uh chris frost do you plan eventually to do away with the site licenses um not uh not uh for the foreseeable um we we need to um to monitor the outcomes from this approach um uh before we make any any drastic changes to the licensing policies um, so no it, it's about choice at this stage we want we want both options to be available great thank you uh, Simon asks I understand that DLL is intended to be introduced in Essex at some point do we have any idea when 
uh, we need to advise developers whether this is likely to be a licensing option available to, for developments proceeding in the next one to two years. It's that is um, you've you've hit the nub of what um, what gives me a headache right now. So um, we we do have a, a delivery profile between um, now and, and and heading into 2020. We're working as quickly as we can on on drafting those licensing strategies and launching schemes. Um, we we need to deliver um, to pump prime the habitat as um, as we said first, and we just that tender's just closing so over the um over the coming months we will be able we'll be we'll be digging ponds ahead of scheme launch i can't give you an exact date for essex it seems to be top of the list for the one i'm asked about when will this one be open um and the the second part of your question about um yeah advice to your clients that's exactly the sort of information i need so we're looking at um allocations data and and what's in the local plan to inform the licensing strategy but in order to better plan habitat delivery um and to think about about how much uptake there will be from developers i, I really could do with that um that kind of information around the the big ticket developments that, are, that, that might be interested in joining the scheme and equally as um, as you allude to, you need certainty um, for your clients about when something will be available. And I'm conscious that at this point right now, um, if I'm not able to give that certainty quite soon, then, um, you know, surveys will start to be planned for next summer, which may or may not be needed if district level licensing is an option. So I'm sorry that gives uh, it's, it's empathy rather than an answer, um, but it's something I want to get the answer to as well. Um, Essex will be in the next six months, I hope. Great, thank you. Um, another question, please reassure me as I'm concerned that a developer is now free to fill in multiple good quality on site ponds and kill GCN, so long as they pay enough money for off-site pond creation, which may support GCN. Yeah, and this this is the nub of, of district licensing. Um, so we, we are now in a position for district licensing in Kent and Cheshire where we, we are securing money and, and we've tried to show you um, the numbers as, as far as we can um, to do something really good for Great Quest in Newts. So at the moment, we're trying to do the right thing in traditional licensing um, and, and there are some, um, some good wins there. But quite often, and, and the available evidence to us is that quite often it isn't working and we need to do something different because populations continue to decline. So although um, I can empathise and, and um, your uncomfortableness of, of filling in ponds with great grist and newts, um, I, I'm, I, am, I too am an ecologist and have worked a lot on great grist and newts, um, but, I, but this, this, is, this, is a, this is a really good uh, mechanism to try and do things differently. So on that site, on, if you've got a particular site in mind, there's developer guidance and there's an opportunity there to work either directly with the developer or the local planning authorities, part of the, the planning commission, to try and um, build in some protections if, you're, if, you, if you really are nervous. Um, but this is designed to do something different um, and strategic for new populations rather than uh, on the site-by-site -site basis. Thank you. Uh, Robert asks, how likely is it that you will run out of places to put ponds? That would be a nice situ situation to be in, in one way, wouldn't it? Um, I, we will continue to update our, our models with that with that living pond layer of where we're where we're placing habitat and and, and, and monitor that um, as as the scheme progresses. Um, I don't I don't think we'll be in that situation um, anytime soon. W would we be in the future? Potentially, yes, and we will continually um evolve this evolve this scheme to suit so if something else becomes the limiting factor pond seems to be the one it is at the moment um then we can we can change the scheme to reflect that circumstance but um yeah if we um um i think we're a way off that yet thank you um Sorry, I'm just looking through the questions as we only have five minutes. Um, are there any that stand out for you both to answer? There's, there's, one, there's one for me actually, which I've seen in the, I think it's in the, in the chat rather than the questions, about um, where you've got survey data, um, 
where, when and if you need to, to use it to inform through licensing. So at the moment, um, it stands that if you've, if you've got, um, if you're aware of survey data um, being old or younger, um, then we require that to be used in the impact assessment. So you'll, you, you have to use the survey, um, that survey route. Um, if you haven't done survey, um, then, then you use the survey, the, the, the no survey route. Um, so that's that's an, an important thing to bear in mind. And we and we we think we're we're considering at the moment revising that um, as well at that two year period and, and extending it um, beyond that. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here from Liz. Can you confirm that 15k is to cover the creation of two ponds and to cover all costs? including survey, negotiation with landowner, planning application if necessary, construction and ongo ongoing maintenance? Yes, and I, I think there's, uh, there's, a, there's an inference in there, <laughs> and I, I can understand it. Um, but we've gone, uh, gone through these costings at great length, and, so, and we'll be constantly revising them. We already are revising them um, in our reviews. Um, and so at the moment, um, they're standing true. And from our work with the habitat delivery bodies in Kent and Cheshire, they, they stand true. Um, but if, if um, they're proving too little or even too much, then, then we can revise in the future. But it's, it's important right. to note that we won't, if it isn't working, we can't, we, we can't use district licensing if these figures don't work. So we can't, we can't let someone into the scheme, you know, if, if all these things aren't tied up. And so we, we've had to subject our own strategies for Kent and Cheshire to an assessment um, using the, you know, the favourable conservation status test. Um, and part of that is to see whether this is deliverable, is licensing deliverable. Um, and we, we have looked at this at great length, if that's any reassurance. That's great, thank you. Um, are there any more questions that stand out to you both? as we have two minutes. I saw someone had asked whether we could run another webinar um, about how to apply. Um, I mean, potentially, if, if there was a want, but we should have the instructions on how to apply on gov.uk. And it, it is, I promise, I really promise, it's relatively simple. I, I as a consultant, have, have had to interact um, with the licensing system myself, and I know it can be, it can be a bit mind-boggling um, and arduous. This really isn't. Um, it's, it's a couple of short forms and that's it. Um, so start with gov.uk um, and if there's still a need after that then we can consider it. So we've got these follow-up webinars, um, i to remember what they are, um, habitat delivery um, and evidence and modelling um, and so it might be that we can come back to those, some of these questions in, in, those, in those webinars. Okay that's great. Um, um, I think that rounds it off quite nicely. If you're both happy to stop there with the questions, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry that we didn't get round to answering them all, um, but hopefully um, the Q and A session and the webinar itself was helpful. Um, and thank you both, Jen and Gregor, for your time today. Um, and thank you for everyone for joining us. And we do look forward to seeing you at the future. Natural England webinars. Uh, before we sign off, um, I can just show you how to record this webinar um, using the competency framework. Um, if I can get my bearings, yep. Yeah, so this webinar can be recorded under the following competencies, um, policy, legislation and standards, uh, facilitation, consultation, engagement and partnering, or environmental management. Um, yeah, and we will also be sending out a feedback form, so please do fill that in with your feedback. And once again, thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to you joining us at the next SIEM webinar.